Hi, everyone. Today, we're um, privileged to have Dr. Brandon Greenwalt here with Greenwalt Family Dentistry at Julington Creek. We're having our Life After Cancer Patient Education Series and specifically discussing the importance of dental care before and after cancer treatment. Thank you, Dr. Greenwalt, for being here, and I'm going to let you take it over. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to see if I can get this slide to come back up. I just had it on there. The share is right here. There we go. And this one. There we go. Okay. So uh, I'm Dr. Brandon Greenwalt. I practice in Jacksonville in the Mandarin and uh, Glickton Creek area. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of dental care before and after and kind of what you need to know. So uh, a little bit about me, um, I graduated from the University of Florida, Go Gators, in 2012. Um, I am married to Dr. Julie Greenwalt, who is a radiation oncologist there at uh, MD Anderson. And we have three little ones, Aiden, Carson, and Annalie. And thankfully, they all look very much like their mother. Um, I got interested in this partly because Julie is a radiation oncologist and partly because after Aiden was born, uh, Julie got a rare form of cancer and we had quite the journey there. She is doing great now, but um, it did make me very aware of the cost of cancer. So I try and help offset that, at least in my practice. And in general, I wanted to be very prepared to help people with things as they um, were going through their journey. And I, I consider it a privilege to go with them. So <clears throat> why is dental management important? Well, uh, radiation, chemo, and head and neck surgery, um, it has a lot of problems that occur all throughout your body, and your mouth is no different. But by seeing an evaluation both before and, and being aware of the things that you can do afterwards, you can prevent a lot of uh, problems. So the most common thing that I hear um, amongst radiation patients and chemo and actually surgery patients, too, is they have a loss of taste. Um, a dry mouth and a higher incidence of caries. These things are, are all pretty related actually. You know, for the radiation and the chemotherapy and also the surgery, uh, a lot of times the parotid glands are affected. And so your spit levels, your saliva is much lower. And your saliva is basic and the cavity process is acidic. So with less spit, you're more likely to have cavities. And um, that's kind of a, a big reason as to why those things kind of occur. Um, sometimes there's prosthetic needs to replace um, a palate or jaw or teeth um, because of surgery or, or uh, complications thereof. And so it's always good if we can have kind of records beforehand so we can help uh, create things. A big one is osteoradionecrosis. This is for the patients that are undergoing um, radiation to the head and neck. And <clears throat> it's mostly a problem in the lower mandible, but can be a problem throughout the mouth. But in general, after you've had radiation, the, the blood flow and the healing is not quite the same in the jaw area. And so you can have a, a high rate of complications with extractions. So in general, you would like to try and take care of things like that before you actually begin your therapy, although that is not always possible. Um, there are some treatments and things that you can do to help prevent this if you find yourself in a situation afterwards where you need um, you know, extractions or things of that nature. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, another thing that, that you want to watch for is uh, bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, bisphosphonates are a type of chemotherapy. And so, um, you know, it's fairly similar to necrosis in that it's a, it's a problem with extractions and things of that nature. So uh, again, you would always like to have kind of a pre-exam so that if something's wrong, you can fix it before it really becomes an issue. Um, so <clears throat> it's important because proper dental evaluation prior to beginning it, it, it increases the, the outcome for both the patient and the physician. Um, it allows for a record of original bite and appearance, which may not seem like a big deal, but you know, if during surgery, more things have to be removed, you can't really go back and get a record of what things looked like before. And so on every individual, the distance between your maxilla and your mandible is very different. Size, shapes of teeth is very different. Um, things like that, it's much easier to do. And, and when you undergo radiation um, or surgery, sometimes you can have mouth sores. And so it becomes 
very painful later to try and get these impressions. So it's much better, if at all possible, to kind of have a, an original record to kind of go from. Uh, it also allows for any removal of, of any teeth that, that are going to be a, a problem kind of afterwards, or if there's a potential to have a problem with it, if it's questionable at all. <clears throat> you know, a lot of dentists, they may not have a ton of uh, patients in the record. I have over 200 head and neck patients. So um, I kind of see how it goes. You know, if, it, if it's a questionable diagnosis on a tooth, I'm not going to tell you to save it because later on it could pre really, really pre present a problem. So it's better if you could get it out kind of before you get to, um, to that moment. And it also allows for fabrication of fluoride trays um, and proper patient education on importance of hygiene. So uh, fluoride trays we'll, we'll get into in a little bit, and that's more for the, the radiation patients. Um, but in general, that's kind of a retainer that goes on your upper and your lower teeth, and it's going to help kind of um, make those teeth stronger so that you don't have that higher incidence of, of caries and cavities. So, you know, if you're going to a dentist, um, you don't have to come to someone like me. Um, you know, you can go to your dentist that you've been going to and you just let them know, hey, you know, unfortunately, I've been diagnosed with cancer and, um, you know, I'm going to need a cancer clearance letter and I just want to make sure that everything's good. Um, you know, you want to make sure you get a, a cleaning and a thorough exam if you can before you start treatment, although I would not let the cleaning hold you up from starting your treatment. You want to make sure you bring all the necessary documents. So what that means is if they know what kind of chemo they're going to be putting you on, or if they know the levels of radiation and where they're going to be administered, um, you know, if they know in the surgery, um, you know, how far that they think they're going to extend, those are all very important questions. And it's nice if the doctor can communicate with um, with the, the dentist can communicate with the uh, oncologists and the surgeons, it really makes things flow a lot better. Uh, MDA is awesome and their surgeons and their oncologists always call me when I'm working with them with my patients and, you know, are, are very, um, they try and let me know, like, you know, if we need to move something kind of along or any of that. And so we're, we're very, um, very blessed in that, that regard. Any teeth with questionable diagnosis, like I said, uh, needs to be removed it's at least seven days before chemo and 14 days before beginning radiation. But sometimes with the masks and things they make for radiation, um, you know, it's hard for them to even get that portion done with, with if you're going to be removing some of the teeth that they're using for, um, you know, points of reference. So you want to make sure that um, you're getting that done as quickly as you possibly can. Anything that needs extensive treatment should be seven days before. So that's going to be like root canals and, um, you know, crowns, things of that nature. Um, and any elective treatment should be postponed. So that is basically like if you can't get the cleaning and you're relatively up on your cleanings, um, you know, I'm not really worried about that. If it's a small filling, things of that nature, not typically worried about those kinds of things. That's not going to prevent you from, um, you know, needing to start your treatment, you just don't want to get in a situation where you're going to have to extract something later. And so, <clears throat> you know, if you have a crown or something like that, you need, oftenly that would be done so that you're, you know, if it's a, if it's a problem with the breaking of a tooth. Um, but it, again, that's not necessarily something that has to get done before you start. Uh, you always want to keep your oncologist and surgeon away, aware of any pending dental treatment. So, um, you know, like I said, at, at MDA, I'm very blessed that, you know, uh, left hand talks to right hand. So, so I'm, I'm pretty good there uh, in regards to here, but you always just want to make sure that your dentist knows your surgeon and your oncologist treatment and their dates of operation and that your oncologist and your surgeon are very aware of any pending dental treatment that you have planned uh, in order to get where you need to be. So uh, some dentists that may not have a lot of um, experience with uh, radiation patients or um, cancer patients, you know, you just want to ask them if they could just take a, an impression of your, um, of your current mouth setup. Most dentists now have digital uh, impressions, but if they don't have that, um, they can definitely take a traditional record. So that way we kind of know, you know, um, where your maxilla and your mandible relate to each other and your bite. And, and also we can use these for the fluoride trace. Um, the fluoride trays, like I said before, are, are kind of like retainers. They go on your upper and your lower teeth. 
and um, you know you're going to put this uh, neutral sodium fluoride gel in there. It's not ketchup, so you're not going to like fill it to the brim. You're just going to put a, a little strip of uh, the gel kind of along in the trays. And you know your various dentists will give you um, guidance on those, but in general, you're going to want to start those trays concurrently with uh, your radiation treatment. But I tell my patients at least by week five, you know, you need to be doing it. Um, and, and that's something that you're going to do 10 minutes a day, every single day for the rest of your life. And I know that that sounds like a lot, but it's, it's really not. And I say it five times in every visit, 10 minutes a day, every day, for the rest of your life. Um, you know, I've been very blessed in my patient population that we have not had very many people have to go back and have to have, you know, hyperbaric treatments or um, extractions and things um, that they need. And a big part of that is my patient population has been very good with wearing their fluoride trays. Um, you know, I've had an individual who wore them great for two years and just decided, hey, I'm done with that. And she came back in six months later and needed like 10 fillings and a couple extractions. And so, um, you know, I, I can't, emphasize that enough. It's a super important thing to, to make sure you're wearing those trays. If you have any major dental changes, meaning that you have any, um, you know, crowns done or um, something where you're changing the, the structure of your teeth, you really need to have those trays replaced. It's very important that they go along, um, you know, the, the collars of the teeth there. Uh, that is the most, you get root caries and things like that. So you want to make sure that that's fitting appropriately. After cancer treatment, your role is you want to make sure that you have really good hygiene and regular checkup. Um, you know, people don't love the dentist. You know, every party I go to, they're super excited when I tell them what I do for a living. But you no longer get to kind of um, do those things. You know, you, you need to make sure that you're making them, uh, making your appointments. And uh, if you don't have a water pick and, um, and or floss or, and you don't have an electric toothbrush, I would get those. You know, it's a super easy thing. It really helps the hygiene of most patients. And, um, you know, if you're one of the rare birds that has never had a single cavity in their entire life, then great. And stick with what you're doing, but just make sure you, you do it more. But if you're not and you're like the rest of us, then you want to make sure you get those things. Um, you want to avoid electric treatments such as whitening and veneers. Uh, you know, whitening is basically putting an acid on the outside of your teeth and you're removing that outer layer. Well, you want that outer layer. That's, that's protection. You know, um, it's like what God gave me for the winter here, you know, like it's a little extra patty. So, so you don't want to take that off by whitening them. It's not worth it. You're beautiful just the way you are. Uh, but here's the same thing, you know, like uh, we have a <clears throat> society that really wants to have a great smile and I love to help people get that. But at the same time, I wouldn't be taking good teeth structure away if you, don't absolutely need to do that in your particular situation. If you are prescribed the fluoride trays, which again is what I was talking about with the radiation, you wanna make sure that you're um, you know, using those uh, 10 minutes a day, every day for the rest of your life. So uh, make sure you do that. And then immediately take care of any issues arising. You know, it's no longer, a, well, that, that feeling that he told me about, I, I hasn't really been hurting me, you know, I don't have any problems. and. Um, you know, your dentist doesn't want to hear from you at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, and you can't wait that long anymore. It's too much of a problem, so you need to make sure that you you uh, take care of those things as they, they arise, and it'll be a lot easier. You really want to try and avoid extractions if it's at all possible. So um, basically, if it's restorable, if it, even if it costs a lot, you really want to spend the money to try and fix it, um, because I can promise you that Extractions are problematic and they will also be costly. And that's mostly because of this year, the, the hyperbaric treatments. So hyperbaric treatments are um, basically like a kind of a, a room or sometimes a capsule that they'll put you in that actually oxygenates your body. And it helps prevent the bronze and the um, osteoradial necrosis uh, by doing these treatments. In general, they can vary, but it's 20 treatments before and it's 10 after. This is kind of a big subject right now in the dental world, actually, um, because insurances are kind of trying to cop out a little bit on trying to cover these. And so because of that, um, you know, if someone needs an extraction, they still need an extraction. And so 
Um, there are a couple papers that I've heard are out there that I have not been able to find to verify myself. Um, and I know that there are some hospitals locally that are saying that you can do um, some extractions without hyperbarics. Personally, the oral surgeons I work with would not do that. And the ENTs that I know would not do that um, or recommend that. And I definitely would not want to do that. Um, so I think hyperbarics are extremely important. There are some risks associated with that. And you know, if that ever comes up for you, I'd be happy to talk to you about those. Um, but in general, it does seem to be the standard of care right now that you would do that. And um, that can be rather costly. So if you can avoid that by getting things taken care of before, that's always the best. <clears throat> Most dentists, um, everybody I know <laughs> would say that implants are not a good idea following head and neck radiation, you know, it's hard because, um, you know, if you have, if you currently have a denture or if you have some spaces in your mouth, you know, everybody kind of intends to get to that phase. But unfortunately, the, the research shows that it's just not very successful. And so if you place those implants, chances are they're going to fail. And, um, you know, I just, even with hyperbarics, um, I just don't think it's a very high success rate. And so I, I hate to tell you to do that and then kind of waste your money. Um, so what should you kind of expect during and after? Um, most patients, you know, they're gonna say that you have a dry mouth and loss of taste. That's kind of the big things. And going along with that, there is usually a drastic weight loss. Um, you know, around 20 pounds is what I kind of usually see. Um, but it's important that you remember that even though if things don't taste the same, you have to maintain your proper nutrition. And if not, you might have to get a feeding tube, at least temporarily. Um, and that's okay if you do to get through your treatment. You know, you do what the, what the doctors tell you to do. But, um, you know, don't lose heart. Most patients do tell me um, about a year after or, you know, a year and a half, um, they'll say that they're starting to get some of their taste buds back and that their, um, you know, their, spit, their saliva levels are, are increasing in their mouth. <clears throat> There's a lot of additives out there that you can try and use to kind of help with the, the dry mouth. In particular, biotin is probably the most well-known product. Um, it doesn't taste particularly great, but they have several flavors out there. And most people do report that that does help. But actually, a more common thing that, that uh, people use uh, is the sugarless lozenge or gum. And that kind of helps tend to, to bring out the saliva for patients and kind of help them feel more regular, but um, you do need to make sure that it's sugarless. If it's not, then we'll have a whole another host of problems that we'll have to discuss. Um, like I said, most of them report getting their, their taste back about a year later and that most of the, some of the dry mouth will go away, but that is something that kind of follows. The, the most important thing to remember is most patients, if they have proper maintenance and they're doing what they should be doing with their fluoride trays and you know you're, you're listening to us when we tell you that you got issues um you're you're gonna be pretty normal on the dental front you know um it's just not the elective stuff anymore you know no veneers no implants no whitening um you know try and find that thing that works for you in regards to having a dry mouth um make sure you're brushing at least twice a day you know it takes four hours for um you know the cavity process to start so you know in the South, we got our sweet tea drinkers, drink it all at one time and brush your teeth. You know, don't be sipping that throughout the day. Um, you know, things of that nature kind of do well. Like we're in a very uh, healthy environment right now. So people love fruit. There's more sugar in an apple than a Snickers bar. So you kind of got to remember that, you know, like it's good if you're eating kind of throughout the day, we want to make sure you're brushing properly and not letting that, that acid and that sugar kind of do its thing. Um, pretty short and sweet lecture today. So I'd like to thank you for your time. If I can ever help any of you with anything, uh, there's my contact info there, greenwaltdental at gmail.com. I would, I would love to be able to help you or the dentist that you go to doesn't really feel confident or have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer anything I can do. Thank you, Dr. Greenwalt. Um, a few questions that um, I um, had prepared from some of our patients. Um, how soon after chemotherapy and or radiation should they wait to have their first follow-up visit? So for my patients, I try and always see them before, obviously, they start. 
And then I do um, three cleanings for them that year. So um, I like to see you every four months. So okay. in general, you know, you're having a six to eight week treatment. So I'm going to see you three to four weeks after that, you know? Okay. So um, I like your, your biggest uh, zone of having issues is within that first year. You're still adjusting to everything. You're having a hard enough time dealing with everything else in your life. You know, oral hygiene isn't optimal. So, um, and your mouth kind of hurts. And one more thing I did forget to mention you know, it is very common with uh, the radiation and the chemo and the surgeries because of this and the stress in general, people will have uh, mouth ulcers come up. And if they do, if they're a dentist like me, they might have a laser that can kind of hit those areas and, and help them, um, you know, take away some of that pain. But um, magic mouthwash is the best. They write it, your radiation oncologist will write it or your, or your chemo doctor will write it um, or your dentist can write it. And we all have our own little concoctions. You actually have to mix it at the pharmacy. Everybody thinks there's the best mine is, but like in general, if you, um, you know, if you're having problems with that, that's definitely something we can help you with. As far as chemicals and mouthwashes and um, toothpaste, are there any to avoid? So, you know, people love to put stuff in their mouth. Like peroxide is like people's favorite thing to do, right? You know, and in general, like I understand the theory of it. Um, but especially with radiation, there is just a lot of harshness on the mouth. And so I would just kind of in general stay away from that, except for like there's a purple Listerine that or a Walmart version is Equate. It's also purple. It's called Total Care. Um, you switch with that for 60 seconds a day. That's a good one. Um, you know, I think it's Crest that makes peroxyl. Some some company makes peroxyl. If you want to do the hydrogen peroxide thing, that's probably the appropriate way to do it. It's um, a mix of that and water and whatever else they can sell. But in general, that does tend to work pretty well for people. But especially during treatment, I would just kind of be careful there. Okay. And is there a type of toothbrush I should be using while I'm on treatment and after I'm on treatment? So any electric toothbrush is the best, you know, I mean, like I like Oral-B because they have a round head. And so, you know, in general, it helps not cause recession, but the $5 toothpaste at Walmart that has the AA battery in it is going to work just as well as the $100 toothbrush at Costco. The difference is battery life. You know, my toothbrush is 11 years old, not my head, but the toothbrush <laughs> is 11 years old. So, you know, like. Um, it's a good investment, I think, to, to get yourself a, an electric toothbrush, you know, like, um, and definitely a water pick. Like, I cannot emphasize enough. Water picks are great. The water pick ultra is probably the best one. It's hideous. Um, you know, you wives will hate it. You husbands will not see anything wrong with it, but it's, it's good stuff. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as gum care, um, is there anything that the cancer survivors should know? Um, you know, should they have a periodontal um, evaluation is the question. So you, you want to, that's part of the thorough dental exam. You know, mm -hmm. like the problem is if, you know, I think it's like 90% of America has gingivitis, which is inflammation of gums. Periodontal, periodontitis is where you have loss of bone. And as we get older, I always say like after 25, everything begins to sag and your bone line is no different, right? So like, um, everybody kind of has a little bit of bone loss here and there, unless you're just really good at, at taking care of it. But it's, it's important to know whether or not if you have 50% bone loss around a tooth, I might be recommending that we extract that, you know, because you don't want to have to do the hyperbarics afterwards in order to take care of that teeth. Now, um, you know, if you've had 50% for 10 years, that's different. But like, if that's just kind of an acute situation or you haven't been to the dentist in 10 years, you know, um, that that is what it is, but it is important to have your your periodontal evaluated. But that is that should be a part of any thorough dental exam. Common question that I get in clinical practice whenever I'm taking care of breast cancer patients are the those that are on aromatase inhibitors, and they um, have frequent bone loss that's exacerbated by the aromatase inhibitors. So we're doing bone densities every few years, and they often will ask you know, since I'm losing bone loss in my hip and spine, should I be worried about my um, bone in my mouth? 
So, I mean, everything's interconnected, right? So, so I mean, like, um, you know, there are some injections and things that they do for those bone loss individuals. And most of the time I'm getting um, requests from their physicians, you know, asking for a, a dental clearance because, you, again, you don't want to have to go in and do extractions or something like that kind of post um, that. So, so it is a good idea, if, especially if you get to that point where they're going to do the injections to help with the, with the bone. Uh, osteopenia that that you um, get a good thorough dental exam and and kind of we'll treat that individually. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to um, talk with our cancer survivors today. I, I really can't thank you enough, and I'm sure we'll be in communication, you know, with all of our patients. Thank you.